On tonight's Wales at Six, flowing in the wrong direction, where the rising rubbish in our rivers is forcing community groups to boycott our beauty spots. Also tonight, bird flu restrictions ease and hens can go outside. But there's no easing up of egg shortages. I'll have the latest situation. Plus, judgment day on the field and off as the rugby regions face off in their final league matches. Coaches ask if a lack of cash could kick the game into touch. And four generations of Collins' family worked at this lost landmark. We'll be revisiting the steelworks which helped forge an industry's future. I was here 30 years. My dad, he'd done 55 years. My grandfather, he'd done 56 years. And my great-grandfather, he was a 40-year man. Hello, good evening to you. How clean are our rivers? Well, not clean enough is the answer from new research from Cardiff University that says despite improvements, things like sewage and microplastics mean there's a long way to go. Some organisations who once used rivers for recreational activities like a Cardiff group of scouts have told this programme they've stopped because of fears about water quality. Our reporter Hamish Alskeri has been examining some of the problems and is on the banks of the Ogmore River for us this evening where sewage has regularly entered uh, the water. So Hamish, what should we take from this research? Well, Andrea, the authors of this latest piece of research say this is a good news story about the improving health of our rivers. But there's an interesting dynamic here in that over the last few decades, some sources of pollution have reduced. But in that same period of time, our understanding based on research about the dangers of pollution, not just to wildlife and biodiversity, but also potentially to us as well, have increased. And that means that some individuals and organisations, as you'll hear in my report, have begun taking a more proactive approach to protecting their local river. Waterways polluted with raw sewage, sanitary waste littering the banks of the River Taff. The landscape of Cardiff has changed a lot since 1990 and while considerable ecological progress has been made, some of the environmental challenges we faced 30 years ago are still very much present in 2023. These two will probably change a bit less. On the riverbank in the northwest of the city, an experiment is taking place. The second Clandaff scouts have just started contributing to a UK-wide exercise to test water quality. So we've joined an organisation called Earthwatch, who do um, a specific water monitoring uh, sort of campaign, which they call Waterwatch. So what you've been watching is the explorers testing the water for phosphates and for nitrates, and also for clarity. So looking at uh, the solids that are carried in the river um, every day. So if you put the tube down on the table. Why do you think it matters? Why does it matter to you in particular? It's quite important because we have to keep our rivers just um, clean and tidy so that everyone can enjoy them. The, the future generation, so our kids would want to, maybe if it's clean enough, to play in it. So we don't want it to be as dangerous for them if they're going to play in it, because that's not exactly good for, for kids. And it's not a nice experience then for the, for the parents if their children get ill because they were playing in the river. That wasn't clean. No, you're OK. Just tip, it, just tip it to the side slightly. For nearly 100 years, generations of scouts here have done activities in and on the River Taff. OK, then pull it out. Now, due to concerns over pollution, explorers are kept at a safe distance. Well done. If you walk up and down the, the edges of the, the taff, you know, you can see um, the wet wipes and other rubbish sort of hanging from the trees from when we flood. It just doesn't feel healthy. Um, so I, I don't take, uh, you know, the scouts or the explorers canoeing anymore and we probably won't until, you know, we feel the water is, is cleaner and, and safer, really. In the 1960s and 70s, nearly three quarters of the rivers in the South Wales Valleys were classified as grossly polluted. But the combined effects of industrial decline, improved regulation and investment have helped to reverse some of the losses to river biodiversity since then. Pollution, though, from the runoff from agricultural land upstream to microplastics is a key issue. 
aside from what's visibly left on the banks of the Taff, the most obvious reminder of pollution into our rivers comes from these storm overflow drains. They're designed to stop the sewage system overflowing into our own homes during periods of heavy rainfall. But last year, Welsh water across the country through pipes just like this one released sewage into our waterways for nearly 600,000 hours. And this is the visible result. After heavy rainfall, sanitary waste ends up in the bushes and trees that line the river here. Community groups and campaigners do their best to clean up, but more just keeps being flushed. How does it make you feel to see all that waste? Because a lot of people find it disgusting to see that on the sides of the river in a major city. It is not a, a, a position we are happy with at all. Um, uh, we really do want to uh, improve the aesthetics of the River Taff. All the storm overflows in this part of Cardiff do have screens, but no screen is, is, is foolproof. If we all avoided putting wet wipes down the drain, uh, sanitary products, and we bin them rather than putting them down the, down the toilet, then this problem wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't occur. There is a will to make further progress. The First Minister said this year, we are a government committed to our rivers. Dur Cymru says it'll invest half a billion pounds between now and 2030 to target the storm overflow drains with the biggest environmental impact. But it's expected that to fix all the problems with that system, it would cost between 10 and 15 billion pounds. Microscopic research has provided some positive news on the changing health of our rivers, but many of the remaining issues can be seen with the naked eye. Hamish Ausgeri, ITV News, Cardiff. Well, Hamish, lots of images there to make us um, stop and think. How, how big a challenge is this across Wales? Well, it's a big challenge and partly because there's huge pressure from people. It's very much on the agenda at the moment, even down here on the banks of the Ogmore. You can see some of that plastic waste, some of that sewage waste littering the trees and bushes. But what you also can't quite see, but just down there in the distance, there's a river monitoring station organised by the Environment Agency. So work is going on to make improvements. The question is how to accelerate that progress. And that's a question I asked one of the authors of this latest piece of research. So I think one of the key needs now is that we've got to understand why that slowdown is occurring. So, for example, in urban rivers, we still have some issues with combined sewer overflows. We think that they're contributing compounds like pharmaceuticals, microplastics to rivers. I think we've also got to understand far better what's happening to the rural river environment. So the basic story of pattern is that urban rivers are getting better, although they're not fully recovered, but rural rivers are probably degrading. So, Andrea, it's clear that there are no easy solutions to this complex national problem, but, uh, and none of them, of course, will come cheap either, either. But progress is being made, but clearly still a lot still to be done. Hamish, hey, on the banks of the River Ogmore for us this evening. Thank you. Elsewhere tonight, a driver has died after a serious crash which shut the M4 near Bridgend in both directions yesterday for around seven hours. Police said the 44-year-old man from Cardiff died after a Mercedes Sprinter van collided with the Central Reservation. It happened on the M4 westbound between Junction 36 and Junction 37. Police have said the man's family has been informed and specially trained officers are supporting them. Energy suppliers can no longer forcibly install pay-as-you-go meters in the homes of over-85 customers, the energy regulator Ofgem has announced. It's after videos emerged of British gas employees breaking into people's homes to install the technology. Energy companies can currently obtain court warrants, giving them legal rights to enter people's homes and fit prepayment meters if customers haven't paid their bills. Plaid Cymru has accused Welsh Government ministers of not being accurate with the advice they received in their move to take Betsy Cadwallader Health Board out of special measures. Back in November 2020, ministers said they'd received advice from a number of bodies, including Audit Wales, that the struggling health board was no longer a special measures organisation. But Plaid Cymru says the Auditor General has written to the party saying he never gave such advice. The board has since entered special measures for a second time. Our reporter Joanne Gallagher is outside Glencloyd Hospital for us this evening. It's all quite complex. Uh, Joe, what's this all about? 
Yes, Andrea, it is. In November 2020, Labour's then Health Minister Vaughan Gethin stood up in the Senate and he said that there was very clear advice from three organisations, Audit Wales, the Chief Executive of NHS Wales and the Health Inspectorate of Wales, to remove Betsy Cadwallader, Wales's largest health board, from special measures. That advice was very clear, he said, and it was down to that advice that they made this decision. But today, Plaid Cymru have released a letter from the Auditor General which puts at odds what Labour have said. This statement reads from the letter, in response to your specific question on whether there was advice from me or my staff to the Minister to de-escalate the Health Board from special measures at that time, I can be very clear there was not. Now, the auditor did admit that being in special measures put pressure on the health board. It made staff morale low. It made it difficult for people to want to come and work here. But the auditor did not say that he backed the idea to remove it from special measures. Now, Plaid Cymru's Green App Yorweth says questions need to be answered. I'm asking them to correct the record. Either they did it deliberately or they misspoke. Either way, we need an apology. We need a correction of the record to say, no, we didn't do this um, based on what the Auditor General said. This was a political decision. The First Minister in his letter to me does say that because that is exactly what is meant to happen. So why try to pin the blame on Wales's Auditor uh, General? That's not what happened. This, you know, the advice didn't come from the Auditor General. Let's get it corrected on the record, shall we? Well, lots of strong words about uh, this, Joe. What's been the Welsh Government reaction? Well, the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, has said that he took advice at the time. It was just this. It was advice. He said it's down to ministers, ultimately, to make the decisions, and that's exactly what they did. Now, Plaid Cymru say that puts him at direct odds to what he said back in November 2020. The backdrop to this, Andrea, of course, is that this decision to take them out of special measures happened in November 2020, prior to those local elections in 2021. So some people saying it was electioneering. In the middle of all of this, though, Andrea, there are people here in North Wales. The trust is still in special measures and people want to know when their next hospital appointment is. Indeed, Joe. thanks very much. Well, it's still ahead on the programme this evening. Ruth is here with the forecast and more. Absolutely, yes. The sun shone across much of Wales today. At long last, I hear you say. The forecast for the days ahead coming up, but we'll also be looking back tonight into our past as we remember a lost landmark of Welsh steelmaking which helped forge our industrial heritage. Look forward to that. First, though, captive birds can again be let outdoors from today after the Welsh government eased rules designed to help with bird flu. The risk to chickens, turkeys and other poultry has been reduced, but officials say some outbreaks remain and keepers should remain vigilant. Our rural affairs correspondent Hannah Thomas has been at a farm near Newport for us to explain. Well, I'm afraid if you were hoping to see free-range hens enjoying the spring evening sunshine, you're out of luck because there are really strict security measures in place at the moment still. So we cannot get anywhere near the hens. However, we can get up close and personal with the farmer and free-range egg producer, Victoria Shervington-Jones. But we're at your egg packing plant here. It's been a very, very big day for poultry producers. It has. So the birds officially can be let out today. Um, obviously, we mustn't take our eye off the ball here. It needs to be 110% biosecurity still. There's still bird flu around that hasn't gone away. And if we drop the ball here, all our hard work over the winter might be not have worth it. Do you think poultry producers are still weary and still concerned about this? Because yeah. we saw, didn't we, a case of bird flu just last week in Newtown? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There's definitely nervous farmers around out there we like I say it doesn't matter whether you've got five birds or 50,000 birds we've got to keep up this biosecurity because um, the birds are outside now they're at higher risk of being in contact with wild birds we need to keep them away from any water courses just to try and minimize the risk as best we can of course we are as I say at your egg packing plant and this has been a bit of a perfect storm for you bird flu and egg shortages which are still continuing it is. It is a bit of a crazy time at the moment. I can, if I dare say, it's even worse than COVID. Um, back in COVID, we could uh, buy eggs in the wholesale market. There's just nothing out there at the moment. 
farmers have lost confidence in the industry. We, the prices of, egg, of everything have gone up so much that uh, farmers are just not putting their chickens back in, which means we are where we are where we are. Who is to blame for this situation? Well, supermarkets were warned back about 18 months ago. They have moved on prices now, uh, thankfully, probably could do a little bit more. But, in, you know, the tap was turned off and to get it running again, we need, we need a good six months from hatching to lay in. And that's where we are at the moment. It's going to be probably 18 months before we're back in full flow. So quite a while yet before we see the light at the end of that tunnel? I would say so. Well, there you go. If you're struggling to buy eggs now, it's likely you'll be still struggling to buy eggs for a long while yet. Still to come on the ITV Evening News this evening. Coming up on the programme, another arrest in the police investigation into SNP finances. The party's treasurer becomes the latest politician to be questioned by detectives following a search at the party's HQ and Nicola Sturgeon's home. Also, prepayment energy meters can be force-fitted once again, but with new measures by the regulator to protect the over-85s. And find out why this award-winning photograph might not be all it seems. So do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Mary with you in about 15 minutes' time. Here, though, Welsh rugby supporters need to be realistic about what the regions can achieve in the seasons ahead. That's the verdict of Ospreys head coach Tony Toby Booth, who says the game in Wales is still adjusting to budget cuts. All four coaches were speaking ahead of Judgment Day on Saturday, where they'll face off against each other in the final match of the league season. Here's our sports reporter, Matt Southcombe. If players and coaches are looking a tad gloomy as the season comes to a close this weekend, then most would probably forgive them. Off-field chaos this year has led to all four regions languishing near the bottom of the league. And the financial reality means that results are unlikely to improve dramatically in the near future. In Welsh rugby, we really have to stabilise now for a couple of years. It's hard to hear, it's hard to say, I guess, because everyone's got ambition, everyone wants to win. But fundamentally, we can't go bust. Saturday is Welsh Rugby's official judgement day, but you could argue there's already been a few of those so far this season. Last month brought about a new financial agreement for the game here in Wales, but the figures behind the deal have left question marks over how competitive our four professional sides can be next season. My personal opinion is I still think there needs to be more money put into Welsh Rugby. Um, you know, they'll probably say that, well, we've given you lots of money already and you haven't achieved anything, but, um, you know, if you're going to say, well, we want you to get to, to winning competitions and you, know, you need to invest in it. You know, ultimately, at some point, how the game's funded is going to have to be re-looked at because at the minute, you know, we're competing against teams like Leinster that spend 14 million on their squad and we're spending 4.5 next year. So, you know, clearly that's something that needs to be looked at. Substantial cutbacks have led to players being offered new deals that in some cases represent a 50% pay cut. Some have already decided to walk away. Players like the Ospreys' Joe Hawkins, the Dragons' Will Rowlands and Ross Moriarty, and Cardiff's Dylan Lewis and Jared Evans. Unfortunately, we're not in a position where we can put competitive offers on the table. They've got to look after themselves and their family. So, you know, I 100% understand it. Sorry to see players like that go because you want to build on, on, you know, on the squad, not obviously lose the important players. But, you know, nobody puts their hand up for pay cuts. And these are substantial pay cuts. So the backdrop is challenging to say the least and Welsh rugby finds itself at the foot of a very steep climb. And there is a feeling that expectations moving forward need to be adjusted. The question that we really ought to have to understand and that's internally and externally and Welsh rugby wise is what success looks like because then we've got something to gauge yourself and do and you know the reality and understanding what is you know achievable rather than what is, you know, just blue sky thinking, as it were. And so the season comes to a close. Four professional sides still exist in Wales and they'll still be around next season. But the fact that's even worth celebrating tells its own story. 
Well, Matt's here with me in the studio now. Um, lots of worry and concern voiced in that piece. It does seem rather downbeat. What can the, the regions realistically achieve next season? Yeah, well, Andrea, everyone's desperate to be positive. I want to sit here and be optimistic. The players and coaches want to be optimistic. But there's a reality and a context to this. As you heard Steph Hughes particularly say there, the gulf in the budgets is, is a real issue for Wales. At the moment, the, the regions are 11th, 13th, 14th and 15th in a 16-team league. So it's not going well at the moment and things are going to get more challenging. I, I get the impression everybody just wants the season to end and it's a familiar feeling. It was the same last year as well. So there's a, there are a few things to, to be bleak about. But there was some good news as well today. You know, the, the Ospreys re-signing Jack Morgan, Welsh international. Scarlett signing Johan Lloyd, Welsh international. But as we listed there, plenty of players are leaving Welsh rugby and, and we've listed a few but more will follow because you know the budgets came too late and they weren't what players wanted and the and the pay cuts were, were not acceptable so whilst we're trying to be optimistic Ruth's going to be with the weather shortly but the outlook in Welsh rugby unfortunately <laughs> is a little bit bleak at the moment. Well you have tried you've tried to put a positive spin on it Matt uh, thank you very much yeah it's time uh, for the weather now Ruth is here um, are you going to be optimistic it does feel like spring was a little bit more in the air today. Yeah absolutely yes Matt always the optimist very much so the sun shone although if you cast your mind back to this morning it was all very grey and murky wasn't it and if you can remember even further back than that say about well 25 years you might recall a particular landmark that towered over the village of Brumbo near Wrexham its historic steelworks have provided jobs for generations of families across North Wales today only a handful of the old buildings still stand and for many former workers there are precious connection to their past as Adiola Dewis has been finding out This was industry on a massive scale. A crucible of smoke, steam and steel. At its peak, more than 2,000 people worked on this site. And it was all here up until the 1990s. This was Brumbo Steelworks. They'd been smelting metal here since 1796. For nearly 200 years, it defined daily life in Brumbo and beyond. Colin was 15 years old when he started at the steelworks, and he was following a family tradition. Myself, I was here 30 years. My dad, he'd done 55 years. My grandfather, he'd done 56 years. And my great-grandfather, he was a 40-year man. Wow. Quite a way. The buildings that remain give you a sense of the sheer size and scale of the steelworks. Avril and Glynn worked there for years, joining thousands of men and women from northeast Wales who made a beeline for Brumbo. It wasn't just a workplace, it was, uh, it was a community and it was friends and... Yeah, it made a big impact on the whole area, didn't it? Yeah. In 1990, the plant's owners announced that they were moving production to Yorkshire. 1,100 workers lost their jobs. The steelworks were flattened. Do you remember your feeling at that time? A horrible feeling. That's it, that's the end. Terrible, but it was the end. I don't think you really believed it was going to happen. It was sad. But the memories of those we worked with and the fun and the laughter, it's, it's there and it... Stays there. Yeah. It's sad when you think what stood here and what it meant to the community, but I always felt we were lucky working here in Brumbo. And you can watch the full story of the Brumbo Works and other lost landmarks on tonight's Vanished Wales. That's 8 o'clock tonight here on ITV One Wales.
some emotional stuff there, but I've got something that might cheer you up a little bit. The sun shone today, as promised, and this was a spectacular scene in Newquay. That was this afternoon. I did say West was going to be West for sunshine, also best in terms of temperature as well. 17.9 Celsius the high today, and a little bit further along the coast in Pothmadoc. But we were pipped at the post for the UK high. It's a bit like a pop picks this, isn't it? By a rather unusual place. You might not expect it, but Kinlochu in the Scottish Highlands, the warmest place in the UK today at 21 degrees Celsius. Why, you might ask, because it is quite unusual for the Scottish Highlands to rise so much. Well, it's because they're slap bang to almost the center of the high pressure that at the moment is dominating our weather story, keeping all these nasties behind me out in the Atlantic. A slight wobble though by the time we get to the end of the week. So make the most over the sunshine over the next few days if you can. Here are the details. Transport for Wales. Proud sponsors of ITV Cymru Wales Weather. Well, for much of Wales, it's a really rather lovely evening. Lots of clear sky, but I think the cloud will tend to pile in through southeastern parts over the next few hours, certainly into the overnight period. And I think by the early hours of tomorrow morning, this cloud could well bring a few showers, but again, confined to just far southern coasts. Elsewhere, a dry night, some clear skies, which will allow the temperatures to drop away. Six or seven will be the overnight low. So it should be a frost-free night. But as the winds actually ease back, we could also see the return of some rather dense mist and murk in places low lying cloud, setting us up much like today for quite a grey and gloomy start to the day. But thankfully that sunshine is building strength. You can see the showers again clipping through southern coastal areas, lots of blue sky developing elsewhere, with the clouds starting to pile in as the day wears on. So I think into tomorrow afternoon, the best of the blue sky will be out towards far western areas. West will be best. Cloudy skies with sunny spells elsewhere. But wherever you are, moderate levels of UV, that sunshine, as I said, is gaining strength now. And the temperatures underneath the sunny skies hitting highs of 16 or 17 in Celsius. I think through tomorrow afternoon, certainly tomorrow evening, the winds will start to pick up the pace. Could be quite strong uh, in places. So we're looking at wind speeds of 20 to 30 miles an hour through Wednesday and possibly into Thursday. But Thursday again is shaping up to be another really rather decent day. Cloudier skies further inland and that's then marks a start of uh, a bit of a change in fortune as that high pressure eases and you can see these frontal systems just starting to knock on the door to far eastern areas. So as far as your outlook then, is concerned, turning increasingly unsettled through Thursday, Friday and Saturday. A few sharp showers, but still plenty of sunshine and still feeling on the warm side. Travnidiaeth Cymru, yn falch i noddi tywydd ITV Cymru Wales. Not to put a dampener on it, but pollen, of course, is still high at the moment. Tree pollen is airborne. We'll have more on that for you in our late update tonight, Andrea. And we did talk about that yesterday, didn't we? Did. We did. Um, different stages of pollen, different types of pollen. All very sniffly. Yes, we're going <laughs> to keep up to date with it all. Thank you very much. And that is uh, Wales at 6. Ness Jenkins is back with your late update after the news at 10. Bye-bye.